Welcome back, troglodytes, to the Troglies Guitar Show. Now, I know what you guys are thinking. What is the story behind this guitar? This is not something that I normally feature on my channel. Whilst down in the lava chambers of the underworld, a proposition was given to me for three guitars. Now it happened really quickly in the Thunder Horse episode, so you might have missed it, but I was told to make an offer on three guitars from the same seller, and that I would get all three, and not just be stuck with the crazy one. <laughs> oh gosh, guys. This guitar, I thought, okay, it'd be funny to do a review on it, because look at it. It's ridiculous and it's flamey, and it's just a weird guitar that I think a lot of people would appreciate seeing. But my motives behind making an offer on this guitar was to get the other two Les Pauls the guy had. He had this really strangely refinished purple Les Paul from the 80s, and he had one of those push tone Les Pauls. So I thought, all right, if I buy every single guitar from this guy, or at least make an offer on all of them, surely we'll be able to make a deal because, you know, that's kind of the power of being a wheeler dealer type is you have the power to buy a bunch of guitars. Now, little did I know when I made these offers that this guy wasn't gonna respond at all. He was one of the seller types that just collects offers and waits for one that's high enough for him instead of countering, because I probably would have paid more than what I offered him initially for the Les Pauls. But other people threw in higher offers, they took the Les Pauls, and on Reverb you've got like 24 hours to respond to an offer, and right at that 24 hour mark I get the email <laughs> notification your offer has been accepted on this monstrosity. So I was bummed that I missed out on two cool Les Pauls, but in the end, I think I'm happy with this experience. This guitar has fire on it. It's got the flames. It doesn't have through neck construction, but that would only make it even better because the only song I could think of with this guitar has to be Kings of Leon, Sex on Fire. <laughs> just kidding guys, it's through the fire and the flames, you know me. That song is just a part of, you know, growing up for me because of the whole Guitar Hero era and everything like that. It's such a powerful song. Now I sure can't play it very well, but hey, I tried a little bit. So just for fun, I'm going to hide four lyrics within this review demo from Through the Fire and the Flames. See if you can find them all. Put the timestamps in your comment. Alright, so funny jokes aside, what is this thing? This is a Minerick the Inferno. Hey Minerick, yeah. Dante called. He wants his guitar back. This guitar, when it was introduced in the early 2000s, was booked as the most scientifically advanced guitar built ever. <laughs> that is such an outlandish claim, but let's find out why. Is this guitar a solid body monstrosity that weighs 15 pounds? No. The company claims that it has specific tone chambering all throughout this guitar, and this guitar has increased mass on its left side for a better bass response, and less mass on the right side for better treble frequencies. They also claim that each and every one of these flame tongues was designed for a specific tonal resonance. 
Does that sound like complete garbage to you guys? I think this is just a fancy shape. Now, yes, if you think about it, sure, I can understand where they're coming from, but I like to imagine a bunch of scientists in a lab with their white coats on going, oh, nope, not that shape, not good enough. Do a little bit more. Nope, too far. Perfect. Does body shape on an electric guitar really change your tone that much? I'm sure it has some sort of effect, but it's negligible as compared to what pickups you have and what amp you're using. Those are the two most important things on an electric guitar. Now acoustic guitar, that's a whole different story. Now back to this whole tone chambering thing. The seller I got this from made it seem like this entire thing was just chambered. But when I opened it up, you can't actually see any of that chambering. So that leads me to believe that there's just random holes around this guitar, kind of like the Swiss cheese weight relief, but probably larger. I really wanted to see this tone chambering, so I took the pickups out, hoping that I would get lost inside, but you'll never find that tone chambering because it appears to be in separate categories, not just in one large area. So maybe there is a method to their madness of where they place those chamberings, but what kind of made me think this guitar was cool is they say that the flame tongues also have the chambering in it. And that had to be a little bit labor intensive to do that. Because you've got a mahogany back and a mahogany neck with what I think is a rosewood fretboard. None of the spec sites would really tell me what it is. And then you have a maple top. Ma now this maple top, I'm guessing it's like a plain maple top with some sort of maple veneer over it. Because as far as quilt tops go, this sure doesn't move a lot. But I could be wrong on that. But this guitar does have binding around all of its edges, which was probably pretty labor intensive, as well as abalone inlay. Here is something else that intrigued me about this guitar. It's got really good pickups and really good hardware. Well, except for the tuners. And when I say really good, we're talking name brand stuff here. It has an SH2 in the neck and an SH4 in the bridge. Those are Seymour Duncan pickups. That is your JB bridge pickup, similar to what I put in that 77 Les Paul Custom. The one that replaced the April Fool's pickup. And then this is the Jazz one in the neck. And that's what is insane about this guitar. Because when you play it, you just don't hear the sound of laughter falling around the world tonight. You hear such fantastic jazzy tones from it. But it's just too wild to take to a jazz gig. I'm not quite sure why they went with the jazz neck pickup. Personally, I did not like the JB in this guitar. It didn't quite sound right to me. It almost wasn't punchy enough, which is surprising because I liked that other JB. The hardware is Godo Tone Pros. And what that means is it is a locking bridge and tailpiece system. And honestly, the only thing I think these are good for is when you take your strings off, the tailpiece stays on. Now this company is very proud of using such nice parts. They even put a sticker on it that says, you know, we've got tone pros on here. But where they lacked is the tuners. They've just got this cheapy import stuff on it. Now they work just fine. I mean, they're your standard tuner. They're not perfect, but they're not garbage either. But I was really upset to see that they don't have a locking tuner on them. It doesn't necessarily have to be like a locking Grover, just a locking tuner in general would have been nice considering that you've got locking bridge and tailpiece and great pickups. These things are not cheap brand new. They're $1,400 and that is just Minerick's import series. Minerick has two different lineups. They have the Studio Extreme series which is their import one, like this. 
And they have their Super Custom Series. I don't know where this guitar was made. They don't really share that information for the Studio Extremes. But other body styles available are the Furry, Goddess, Inferno, which is this one, Lotus, Medusa, and Obscura. Now they have a hundred million other different things as well as those models previously mentioned in their Super Custom series, but the Super Customs are all hand built in the USA, but they're quite pricey. Now does this look kind of familiar to you at all in certain parts? If you think it looks like a BC Rich, it's because the Minerick brothers, the people who started this company, helped BC Rich design some of their guitars. This headstock is very reminiscent of the Rich Bitches. And if you've never seen one of those, no, I'm not cussing. That's just what people call them. R-I-C-H-B-I-C-H. -I -I I've had a 10 string and a 7 string. I couldn't really do justice on either of those, but those videos are out there if you're interested in seeing them. Strapping this guitar on, is it ridiculously heavy? Are you going to feel the pain of a lifetime lost in a thousand days? No, it weighs about eight and a half pounds. That's not too bad. It's well distributed. It's actually kind of comfortable to play. The strap buttons are in kind of strange spots here. You've got one right here on the top horn, and then you've got one here. But since they're both on the back of the guitar, you have to kind of reverse your strap, which is weird at first, but it still works just fine. You don't really have any neck dive going on or anything. Playability-wise on the neck, you have the frets going over the edge of the binding so you don't have nibs or anything. That's kind of a Gibson snobbery thing anyways. This is probably technically easier to play on. I didn't notice any dead spots. It actually plays really well and it feels good. This feels like a really high-end Epiphone. I wouldn't necessarily say it's like Gibson quality or like a high-end PRS. It still kind of has that I've been imported from Asia feel to it because I'm pretty sure this is a poly finish. It's a little bit more plasticky feeling. You can see how the binding does this thing. That's what they do on Epiphones. But a nice feature that I like seeing here is it does have a volute on the back of the headstock. The output jack is right here on the side. It's kind of right here, which I think is kind of a weird spot. I mean, it makes sense, but when you've got a guitar plug hanging out there, eh, it's not the most beautiful looking. I kind of wish they would have tried putting it right here. Maybe try to do like a Strat output jack where it actually kind of bends into the guitar. That way, you know, it's in a slightly more traditional spot, the way it kind of hangs out instead of just straight down. That's kind of a tall order. It might mess with their whole scientific approach for this guitar, but I think it could have been possible. The inlays are supposed to be torch orchids blooming from the bottom to the top. I'm not quite sure what a torch orchid is. Maybe we'll throw some pictures up on the screen. If you've ever found yourself thinking that you're so far away, you wait for the day that such a monstrosity would grace your presence in a beautiful fire and flames type of thing. Here it is. You might not have known about this before, but now you do. There is one notable user for these guitars. Lemmy of Motorhead used a bass version of this guitar at some concert or something. In the end, for what I paid for this guitar and what I can offer it for, I am actually impressed with this thing. I think a lot of it comes down to just having good pickups. It's not overly heavy. It's a little bit gimmicky. I mean, if you don't like this cherry sunburst version, there's a black one. Then there's a really cool mirror one. If you take a look at this music video, wh what is this guy doing right here? 
I know what he's trying to do, but he just looks like he's having a seizure. So yeah, I would suggest actually picking one of these things up. I thought it was a very good guitar. Now would I suggest paying $1,400 brand new? Nah, probably not, but if you can pick one of these up, I would say 800 is probably the most you should pay. I really don't know the market for these guitars. Maybe I way overpaid and the guy's laughing. <laughs> but I'm glad I got the chance to check something else out. It's freaky, it's weird, but it's mine. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and hear how it sounds. Let's go ahead and look at the condition of this guitar. You've got a big M here that stands for Minerik. You've got some light play wear on this guitar, some scratches on the face of the headstock, but nothing too bad. Truss rod, it works just fine. It's kind of one of your import style truss rods. This one was not a collector's piece. It was pretty heavily used when I got it, but after some cleaning, it looks pretty darn good now. 
I oiled this up really nicely. You've just got some minor fret wear. Nothing that you're gonna have to get addressed, but there is some to know about. Mainly in like the cowboy court area, but very minor. You've got some picking scratches and fingerprint smudges. Most of this would wipe off again. Uh, every time I touch this guitar, it just gets dirty because there's so much surface area for your hand and arm to get on. It's definitely hard to clean in between these tongues. Those things were filthy. But you've got two volumes and a master tone selection, but like no major chips off this guitar or anything, just some light wear and tear. There is some wear to the gold. You can see it's worn off in some areas, especially on the bridge here. It looks like the player that used this a lot liked to anchor his hand right there. And that kind of rubbed that right on off. Back of the headstock, it looks like serial number is woo! Just kidding, W00231. Again, you've got a sweet volute. And being a poly finish, it doesn't really show too much wear. So there's not a lot to say about the neck on this one. I would describe it as almost a medium C profile. In the Gibson world, it's just a little bit chunkier than like a slim 60s, but not quite what I would consider a 50s neck. But I'm sure like Gibson would advertise it as one. So if you like a tweener neck, that's kind of what you've got here in between a 60s and 50s style. You've got some minor scratches on the back, but you know, for such a crazy guitar, I mean, this is definitely meant to be on stage. You would think it would have more wear than it does. So if you can live with some light wear and tear, you're gonna be very happy with the condition of this guitar. Now we'll take a look at the sides here. Again, just light wear and tear. I do want to talk about this output jack. I haven't had any issues with it other than this nut likes to come loose a lot. So I have to keep retightening it. But other than that, I mean, it functions just fine. It doesn't ever cut in or out on you. So there we are. Let's go ahead and look at it under black light. I don't think it's going to do anything though. As expected, it doesn't glow, but the binding kind of changes the color. This is actually kind of cool. I like this. I wish they would do glow in the dark binding. You know, you know, forget the whole abalone stuff. Just make it glow in the dark because, oh, I love this. Look at this, guys. It's like a dark tobacco sunburst all of a sudden. This thing looks really evil. It just looks like something that should be flying around menacingly. So not much to go over on this guitar under black light besides that it looks awesome under it because all this white stuff is now glowing. And I thought I saw that the M was like surrounded in a different colored lacquer or something and this confirms that. No mysterious signatures by Bernie Rico Jr. this time. Uh, so no breaks, cracks or repairs but you don't really need a black light to tell that on this guitar. So you're probably wondering, what kind of case does a guitar like this have? Well, thankfully at least has a case. This is something Minerik had to get custom ordered for their guitars. It's kind of one of those in between a hard shell and soft shell case. It kind of reminds me of like a violin case. It's got that felt like exterior to it, but then it has like a leather like outside at this part. You can see it's got some sticky stuff on it, but for the most part, it holds up just fine. The inside is custom molded specifically for an Inferno, as you can see here. And this is actually a really nice case. It's really dense foam. So I think it would definitely survive being on the road. You've got a key for the case. It does have one traditional latch as well as a zipper. And here you have a tag saying it was set up in the USA by Minaret Guitars and Eric's Guitar Shop. And that was 112404. So that means this guitar is likely a 2004, maybe a late 2003. If you think you might be interested in being the next owner of this Minaret Inferno guitar, feel free to check out the reverb listing. There is a link in the description. 
This might not be an everyday guitar, but honestly, it plays well enough to be one. You definitely stand out on stage with this guy. Thank you, Charles Dice, for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Share this video with a friend who would enjoy it. And we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.